good morning uh dear colleagues uh wherever you tune in from or you're joining us from uh good afternoon if you are in a different uh time zone welcome very much uh to our webinar uh today um uh, the focus group discussion and webinar uh the state of climate and the information in east africa uh we're very grateful uh, that you're joining us uh, in great numbers all the way uh, from Nairobi, Kenya, to Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and elsewhere in our great continent and indeed uh, the world. My name is Kiondo Bavero, a project manager for the Earth Journalism Network, uh, East African Wildlife and Conservation uh, Journalism Project, and I'll be your moderator today or MC if you like. Uh, together with my colleagues uh, who you will meet later today, we are delighted uh, to be holding this very unique and important uh, webinar on climate misinformation and disinformation in East Africa. Why do I say unique? Uh, this is because we are not only having the webinar to inform you, our audience, but it's also a form of a focus group discussion where we are hoping you will kindly share your experiences and uh, reporting on climate change. The first focus group discussion is one part of the tools that we'll be using to collect data for the survey uh, on climate mis disinformation, which you'll hear more about today as we launch it. On the other hand, it is an important webinar uh, because it focuses on what I like to think is the story of the century, the story of the climate crisis, and especially for our continent. See, Africa suffers far more the effects of climate change despite having the lowest historical contribution of greenhouse gases, which are responsible for human-induced climate change. This has seen the continent already experience loss and damage from effects of climate change, including reduced food production, water shortages, and biodiversity loss. This story, dear colleagues, must be told from a fact-based standpoint. And that is why we are covering this study and involving you. We hope the findings will lead to a larger journalism project on how to effectively uh, report on the climate crisis in Africa. Um, so um, I'll take you through the program uh, for the day uh, before we start. Uh, my colleague, uh, Jackie Lidubi, uh, will start us off with a brief introduction about the study that I've just mentioned and about this project. I will then uh, go into breakout rooms uh, in each room, there will be a facilitator who will guide at the focus group conversation uh, for about 30 minutes. The facilitators will take notes to share with the larger group after the group discussions. Please give them all the support they need, keeping their thoughts brief and to the point. After the 30 minutes, we will reconvene the larger group or the plenary, if you like. Here, the group facilitators will post their specific group discussions I will highlight the points as they type them. This will take about five minutes. And then I will have the highlight uh, of this webinar, a key note speech uh, by our guest speaker, Jen King, who will be joining us uh, after the group discussions. Uh, so Jenny, Kim, Jenny, Jenny King helped found the climate action against disinformation, a coalition of, of over 50 organizations working to identify analyze and counter this issue of climate mis disinformation across the world. As Jenny speaks, if you have any question, please post them on the Q&A feature. Do not use the chat to ask a question. You can use the chat icon uh, to tell us who you are and where you're joining us from. Uh, finally, uh, we'll have our internews research expert, Isabel, uh, who has been very helpful in designing the survey questions, uh, she'll have the final word as well as share the survey link uh, to all of us. Thank you so much again uh, for jo joining us and be sure to put your questions uh, when we have our guest speaker on the Q&A uh, icon uh, just below your screen. And now I'll invite our first speaker, uh, Jackie Lidubui, uh, to do an introduction about the project. Jackie, I hope you can hear me and you're free to share your screen.
Thanks, Kiyundu, and hi, everyone. I'm so glad to see all of you and also to see a number of journalists joining us from Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya, and even other East African countries. So for my friends from Tanzania, I'm Jamboni Sana, Nakaribuni Sana. And uh, from Uganda, my friends, Mbala Musitsa, Basebo na Banyabo. In Ethiopia, Salem. And back home, Kenya, Saseni Mkopoa. Uh, I'm Jackie Lidubi, and I'm happy, and I have the privilege to take you through this, uh, this short discussion on our project on climate misinformation, disinformation in East Africa. Jackie, can you put that into presentation mode, if you don't mind? Yeah. Is it in the presentation mode now? Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. So information can be a spark because information can lead to people acting. And information can lead to maybe positive or even negative effects. And even to well-intended communities, when they have misinformation, they, it can lead to harmful environmental practices, especially if they have very uh, negative information about climate change. So, and Africa, as Kyundu has stated, is one of the largest ecosystem and biodiversity. But uh, false information on climate change has led to the increased use of fossil fuel, increase in deforestation, and it has had a very bad effect and impact on people who live in Africa. So misinformation has causes and impacts on climate change on communities. And as, as I've already said, misinformation disappropriately affects low-income communities leading to social inequality. And journalists in these low income countries like Africa, like East Africa, like Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, lack resources. We also lack knowledge and even the capacity to fact check the true information that is, that is there. So what do we know? So as internews, we know that trusted information is critical to combat misinformation. And also climate change is an intersectional issues that uh, that most of risk uh, that brings uh, risk to most communities and bearing a lot of effects beyond this dissemination of good information social media also plays a big role social media it should be held accountable because if we have also bad information on social media then climate misinformation continues and citizens must also be empowered to be able to know how to separate good and bad information and most of the time this is our work as journalists to do this work so what we want to know through this project we want to know what is your knowledge as journalists about this climate misinformation do you report climate change as real and caused by humans do you feel the need to report the sources who claim otherwise on climate misinformation? Do you come across attempts of climate disinformation when you are doing your day-to-day -day reporting? And what are the narratives about climate misinformation that you have encountered? And a journalist, are you guys reporting on climate misinformation? So how are we going to do this? We are going to do this by conducting a qualitative and quantitative research survey and one of the things we are going to do is the first one is running a webinar, what we are doing currently. And in this webinar, we are going to have a focus group discussion with you guys so that we can be able to answer some of the questions that I have asked. And also we are going to disseminate a questionnaire and we are also going to have a, a, keynote, speak, a keynote speech from Jenny who will give us a, just a complete overview about climate information, climate misinformation, and climate disinformation, and even bringing it closer home. So at the end of it, we are going to write uh, an initial report, give com uh, recommendations on fighting climate misinformation, and hopefully have a larger project whereby we'll have uh, trainings and we have capacity buildings on journalists in East Africa on how to uh, report on climate information and how to check on misinformation and disinformation. So thank you so much and back to you, Kiyondo.
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jackie, uh, for that brief and uh, to the point uh, presentation. Uh, at this point, I uh, will about to go into uh, group out, uh, breakout groups, sorry. And before we get there, I'm hoping to uh, hear from my colleague uh, if you're ready. Uh, but if you just joined us, uh, thank you uh, for joining us for this focus group uh, discussion as well as a webinar uh, looking into climate uh, myths and disinformation uh, in East Africa. You know, kindly, uh, we will start with the breakout groups. After that, uh, we'll have a keynote speaker uh, from Jenny King, an expert uh, in climate change issues. And uh, uh, please ask her questions on the Q&A, do not use the chat, uh, but please be sure to check the chat uh, because my colleagues are sharing very important information uh, about uh, this webinar uh, and other opportunities uh, that we have. If you're not uh, already uh, a member, uh, of EJN, uh, that is Earth Journalism Network. You can go to our earthjournalism.net uh, .net website and there you find information on how you can join us and then uh, you uh, be ready uh, to be getting a lot of uh, uh, opportunities like this webinar, uh, story grants, as well as uh, even funding uh, to go uh, to, uh, to fellowships related to the environment, biodiversity, as well as climate change. Um, uh, so be, be sure to ask me questions uh, on Q&A uh, and this uh, webinar is being recorded and you can find that in our website after that as well as on our YouTube channel. Uh, so Hannah, uh, please uh, let me know uh, when we are ready uh, to go into the breakout groups. Well, well, well folks, welcome back. <laughs> I hope you all had a great exercise uh, with all the tech challenges. Uh, we really do apologize uh, for that. Uh, I can tell you we had a really good number of 100 people joined uh, for the webinar. That was a record um, in most of our webinars. Uh, but even with these, uh, I can say we've lost just a few. We're about 70, uh, 68. So that's a group. Uh, a good number. I'm all, almost tempted to ask one of the facilitators to tell us uh, that was not in the plan initially, but with this, I think. Uh, who do I give? Benon, you want to say in two seconds what the experience was, and then I'll ask all the facilitators uh, to please key in on the chat uh, your main points, starting with question one. Uh, Benon, if you could tell us. Yes. Um, it was a quite enriching discussion. There was a, our group, we were four, uh, well, five, including myself, um, with with the, a listening post uh, some, uh, from EGN was observing. But we, we had a rich discussion, and I can say we actually didn't have enough time to complete uh, <clears throat> to complete our discussion. So what we have done is to ask, uh, especially for the last uh, question, we, the, the thoughts will be shared with uh, me uh, by chat box, and I'll still include them in, the, in, in my presentation. But yes, there was a lot to say and very little time to say it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Benon, and I'm very sure it was for the other facilitators. I was with Esther. I, but we had some challenges there. People were not able to join us. So it was a group of about two uh, or three individuals. So uh, thank you so much again, facilitators. Uh, kindly, uh, if you could start putting in uh, your discussion points uh, on the chat, I uh, will do this for the next uh, five minutes. I'll be able to read them. Uh, so if you start with question one, how do you get information about climate change? When you're reporting a story and where do you get this information from I, i'll be reading that as you write uh and then of course uh, you you know you save the chat you shared with us of uh, the larger uh, survey uh, that we're doing and of which you've shared the link uh and i hope uh, everyone has seen that link uh so um, I will start from uh, John Javula uh, for question one. He says we get information from experts, uh, primary sources, that's a research 
papers, NGOs, and the community. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us um, what was also the most surprising thing you learned in the discussion group? What was the most interesting thing someone else say, said in the chat now? Yeah. Yeah, I think because you don't have much time, uh, you can finish on what you are typing. I can see you busy typing. Uh, and, and then because you share with us on this chat and you share the resource uh, with everyone else, uh, maybe we, we can discuss the most uh, salient uh, points uh, from your discussions uh, instead of putting from one to three for the interest of time. Uh, and I'm very sure our guest is with us now. Uh, Jenny King will be joining us uh, in the next, uh, who will be taking stage. Oh, she's here. Thank you so much uh, and much welcome. Uh, Let's give it a few minutes. Uh, Jackie, you can let me know uh, when the five minutes are up. <laughs> yeah, uh, so Joyce Chibi, a facilitator says, uh, they have they had a total of five participants, two facilitators. Uh, they were very resourced. Uh, the session ran smoothly, uh, source of information, UN, uh, local experts, government, and climate dockets. I don't know what that means. Government and climate dockets, sorry. Uh, and also from the uh, community. Yes, I think uh, the event source is the UN FCC. Uh, we had group 16. Uh, Rosa Dengo is our colleague here. Uh, says the source of information uh, from victims of climate change. Uh, you know, related calamities. Uh, friends, floods, drought, yeah. And uh, we know these are the consequences of climate change. Uh, another source is uh, elders who are custodians of information. Uh, there comes indigenous knowledge, climate activist groups. Of course, government, communication officers from nonprofits working you in community. Know? Yes? It's time to move on now. Okay, uh, Esther says, we get sources uh, this could be people affected by adverse effects of climate change uh, like uh, the other group said experts of climate change and scientists uh, thank you so much um as team experts on governmental organizations i think we all you know uh, had, had the same uh, kind of thoughts and ideas and be very good when we compile all these in the report uh, that we will be disseminating the findings in about three or four months and to be you know, very interesting uh, to have all of these aspects uh, in that uh, in that uh, report. Uh, so right now, I will introduce our guest and main speaker, who we have all have seen is around. Uh, her name is Jenny King. Uh, I had introduced her before. Jenny King is the head of climate research and policy at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. As she leads EFOS to translate digital research into frontline programming and response. Through ICD, she helped found Climate Action Against Disinformation, a coalition of over 50 organizations working to identify, analyze, and counter misinformation worldwide. She has spearheaded investigations on climate denialism and discourses of delay in contexts including Australia, Canada, South Africa, Germany, as well as well as she's co-authored ICD's flagship reports such as Deny, Deceive, Delay, that is volume one and two. Uh, Jenny has spearheaded and manages the COP uh, intelligence unit on behalf of climate action against this information. And she leads over 15 partners to produce real-time monitoring of myths and disinformation around the annual climate summit. Uh, so good folks, we are in good hands in Jenny King. And Jenny King, we're looking forward uh, to learning uh, from you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me today. Can everyone see my screen and also hear my audio? Thumbs yes. Up? Yes, Love excellent. Yeah. Okay, per good start. I want to, to begin by saying that there is an enormous lack 
of research around climate mis and disinformation across the African region. This is a problem that applies to a lot of non-English speaking contexts um, outside of Europe. We have partnered with entities like Code for Africa, who do sort of data journalism or investigative reporting and have more of an interest now in looking at climate themes. But nonetheless, the case studies that are exist that exist are, are limited. So I'm really interested also to you know, develop relationships with the people on this call today, or indeed to get leads from you on what you're seeing in your individual context and where you think there would really be a benefit for generating more of an evidence base, because we know that there are a huge number of influence operations that are targeting countries within, particularly the sub-Saharan African region, but there has not been the necessary resource mobilized to deliver the kinds of reports and research that organizations like ours have produced for North America, for Europe, for the Asia Pacific. And I really hope that that can change in the coming months and that coalitions like ours can work with media outlets and other partners in the region to make sure that that happens. Nonetheless, I will try and take you through some headline trends of what we've seen in the past two and a half years as we've been doing this research worldwide. And in particular, some small data sets or pieces of evidence that are specific to contexts within the region and that might help to inform your reporting and your coverage going forward. So the first thing that I, I want to say, and this is certainly true in the global north, is that the conversational landscape around climate has shifted a huge amount in recent years. So rather than just having conversations about climate policy or climate science, it has become a topic weaponized within what we call the culture wars. So it's become a highly polarizing and partisan issue that relates to aspects of identity politics and divisions within a number of societies. And what that means is that the people influencing climate conversation have also changed. So rather than it purely being industry actors or policymakers or you know, traditional institutions, you now have a vast ecosystem, particularly in the online space of influencers, of you know, commentators who are acting as the way for average people to understand climate change as an issue. And those individuals often have no background in either climate science or in climate policy, but also many of them are monetizing the outrage economy online. So they are purposefully posting content which is false or misleading or incendiary or divisive because it generates clicks and engagement. And as a result, they are able to generate profit through advertising revenue. And we've seen that happen to other policy issues. Migration is one, you know, section on reproductive health rights is another, electoral integrity is another, and climate is arguably the kind of latest victim in that trend in that it has become this highly polarized topic. And that means that you have both industry actors extremist actors, conspiracy movements, and media outlets all occupying the same conversational space. The other thing I would say is we're, we're very often asked at ISD, why does it feel like climate mis and disinformation is reaching a fever pitch at this particular moment in time? And what I would say to that is that mis and disinformation thrive in times of crisis. And it doesn't matter if those crises are economic, if they are political, if they are socio-cultural, or if they relate to other factors, but it creates really fertile soil for these kinds of narratives, both to penetrate the public and to resonate with average people. And at the moment, we are living through a period where a number of intersecting crises are happening in parallel. So not only did you have the COVID-19 pandemic, which obviously connected the whole global community, and in you know, Africa was also coming off the back of the, you know, the Ebola crisis and other public health crises, 
But you then also have the aftershocks of the pandemic in terms of the cost of living crisis, issues with rising inflation, people's inability to pay their bills, you know, massive increases in poverty and deprivation. And then a compounding factor on top of that was Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which again sent all of these shocks through global supply chains on energy, on food production, and a number of other key areas, which had huge and devastating effects on regions outside of the global north. So, you know, the Middle East and areas of Africa in particular have been hit by the, the wheat shortages as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Sitting behind all of that are some of these bigger generational challenges, such as the increasing wealth gap. So the, the difference between rich and poor that exists in countries all over the world, as well as the erosion of trust in institutions. So people no longer having faith in governments, in media outlets, in academic institutions, and instead turning to these other gatekeepers in order to navigate and understand the world around them. And, and I think in the context of, of East Africa, you know, you can add on top of this a number of other sort of ongoing and, uh, and serious crises, uh, which could include, you know, spikes in violence, um, the, the persistent threat of kind of terrorists and extremist groups, which are not unique to, to East Africa, but kind of sit alongside all of the factors that I've already put on this slide. And what that means is that you have, in a way, the perfect conditions for bad actor behavior to thrive both on and offline and to really influence vital public debates and understanding on key issues like climate. More broadly, I'm not going to go into all of the granular detail of this diagram, but I will share some links in the chat that are incredibly useful if you want to start understand the evolution of narratives that we have seen over the past sort of decade, two decades in relation to opposing climate action. Now, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with the traditional forms of climate denial which claim that climate change doesn't exist, that it's a hoax, that it's a scam, that climate science is unreliable, that climate modeling is, is, is you know, uh, can't be trusted. That certainly still exists, but I would say that it has largely been pushed to the margins of public debate. And that generally there is a consensus in many countries around the world that climate change is a real problem and that we need to take action on it. However, there is a huge gap between recognition of the problem and actually being able to pass and implement meaningful policies to deal with the problem. And I often refer to that gap as the final mile. And it's in that gap that you see a lot of influence operations and mis- and disinformation being targeted, is in trying to delay or, or sow the seeds of doubt around the pathways forward to achieve the targets of the Paris Agreement or to, or to implement a net zero transition. And that what you do is you slow down those processes or you weaken the public mandate to such an extent that actually the status quo is maintained for years and years without any meaningful progress. And some of the, the tactics that are, are put on this screen here are, for example, saying that it's not our problem and that somebody else should be dealing with it. Now, this is very, very prevalent in North America and Europe. And you will see arguments framed as this is China and India's problem. They are the biggest emitters currently. So we're doing enough on climate change and it's their, it's their job to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. You will also see it in the global south with the argument of, well, we don't need to consider renewable energy infrastructure or changes to consumer behavior because we are not historic emitters. So it's the role of the global north. And there is definitely legitimacy in some of those arguments that countries which have historically had very low emissions arguably do have less of a role. However, that doesn't mean that they are not part of 
building a sustainable and renewable future. And you will often see fossil fuel lobbies in, for example, sub-Saharan Africa, using these kind of arguments that, well, we should be allowed to burn as much coal as we want because it's America and the UK and China who have been the biggest carbon polluters in history. And, you know, it's our turn to catch up. And actually, that is very counter to the principles of multilateral policy agreements. <laughs> and it's also counter to what is being said by climate scientists within the global south itself. I also just wanted to highlight, because I, I think it's, it's interesting to take a slight step back and be aware that misinformation and disinformation about climate is only one type of content that exists on and offline. And there are very many public policy issues which are vulnerable to these kind of attacks. I've mentioned some of them already, you know, public health, electoral integrity, gender rights, civil rights. However, there are certain things that make climate distinct. And the biggest of those is that there has been a professionalized disinformation industry working on this issue set arguably since the 1970s. And what I mean by that is, you know, companies associated with oil and gas, associated with the agricultural movement, associated with the automotive industry that have developed a very sophisticated playbook and a very sophisticated messaging calendar that they launder into the mainstream through traditional advertising, sponsored content, PR and lobby groups, and also through dark money efforts that are very difficult to unearth, even through investigative journalism and open source intelligence. And we know that there are still billions of dollars being invested every year across social media and legacy media for them to normalize those talking points. Um, so, so generally speaking, there are more financial stakeholders who are invested interests, who are working on climate mis and disinformation than there are for other issue sets. However, acknowledging that fact, it is true that climate mis and disinformation is also becoming more organic and decentralized. And what I mean by that is what I was saying at the top of the presentation, that as it's become a polarizing topic and as it's become increasingly weaponized within the culture wars, there are now a huge diversity of actors engaged in this conversation who are not necessarily on the payroll of an oil and gas company. They are spreading this content themselves for whatever reason, ideological motives, financial motives, whatever it may be, but they are not necessarily connected to this coordinated industry-sponsored effort. They are merely sitting alongside it. And quite a lot of the tactics that you see around mis and disinformation are common with other areas. So, you know, there is a huge use of memes and short form and long form videos, which are very difficult to research because you cannot automate collection on videos. And there are kind of embedded images that you might not pick up through doing keyword searches. It's also highly focused on scapegoating specific individuals. So, you know, Greta Thunberg is a classic example, but in countries like Brazil or in, uh, in Africa, we've seen local or indigenous climate activists also be used as scapegoats. People like Vanessa Nakate, for example. Um, and that is a really common tactic used by mis and disinformation actors to try and discredit climate action and climate policy as a whole is to victimize certain individuals. We also see the importance of catchphrases. So using these kind of these, these headlines, which are very emotive and, are f and you flood the zone with the same content over and over again in order to create the impression that that is mainstream opinion, when actually it's often coming from a very small group of actors who are both dedicated and highly active in the online space. And then underlining all of this, at least in the global north, and I'd be interested to hear if you think this is true of the global south as well, is a mistrust of institutions. So the idea that net zero agendas and climate policy as a whole is illegitimate because it's 
being led by multilateral institutions and governments and so-called elites at the at the disadvantage of average people and that those kind of conspiracies lie under a lot of mis and disinformative content that we see online so now i just wanted to take you really quickly through a couple of case studies that touch explicitly on the african context um, that we have picked up particularly in our research around the COP summits, so the global climate summits, but that I think are broader trends worth exploring further. And as I said, I'd be really interested to know if you've come across this yourselves or if you'd be interested in, uh, in looking into it further. The first is what I refer to as woke washing of climate opposition. Now, you may have come across the term greenwashing before. Um, woke washing is the idea that you use what is broadly viewed as progressive or liberal language, but to make an argument against climate action or climate science. And the examples here that I wanted to draw on are specifically coming uh, from Kremlin-sponsored networks, so associated with the Russian state, as well as Chinese state media. And then they are very popular among American uh, pundits and commentators. And essentially, the argument is that achieving net zero is an imperialist agenda. So in and of itself, it, it, it doesn't necessarily fall neatly into the category of mis and disinformation, but it is certainly a form of influence operation that is trying to affect policymaking in sub-Saharan Africa and trying to affect the diplomatic position that countries in that region will hold at events like COP by saying, you know, the Paris, the goals of the Paris Agreement are another way for the West to keep Africa in a position of dependency on the global North. It's a way of reproducing Western imperialism uh, and neo-colonialism. And actually fossil fuels are the only way for countries in the region to develop, even though climate scientists from the region, climate activists from the region, and many policymakers from the region are saying that that is patently false. And you see the fossil fuel lobby using the same kind of arguments. So this is a really interesting emerging tactic that plays on this really complex and traumatic history within regions like Sub-Saharan Africa and, and preys on a lot of very legitimate concerns about Africa's ability to, to develop and the way that kind of the extractive economy has, um, has destroyed certain economies in the region to the benefit of the global north. Um, and you know, there are some specific examples on the screen here come from Russia Today, which is the sanctioned, currently sanctioned outlet in the EU, but is, is state-affiliated um russian outlet cgtn is a chinese state media outlet michael schellenberger is one of the most prominent american commentators he has around 700,000 followers on twitter and he's making exactly the same arguments which is that we shouldn't pursue climate action because it's going to keep people in poverty in sub-saharan africa that is cherry picking data and ignoring what people within the region are actually saying about the transition uh, and then one other interesting example from North Africa here, this is again a Russian state affiliated outlet, which was trying to defend uh, Colonel Gaddafi, the former uh, dictator and ruler of Libya, by saying that he used oil wealth to create economic development and prosperity within Libya. So it's again, it's using this progressive language around bringing people out of poverty and creating more equity and pushing back against colonialism to make an argument against climate action, essential climate action, even though we know that the environmental impacts of climate change are being felt the worst in regions like East Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, and that there is a desperate need for global action in order to mitigate those impacts. The second case study, it was really interesting, and it was around the role of the African fossil fuel lobby, particularly at the COP summit in Sharm el-Sheikh last November. 
I don't know whether any of you have come across a, a lobbying entity called the African Energy Chamber, but they are an industry trade group who do a lot of work internationally, and they lobby for the increased use of fossil fuels across the African region, in particular for coal and oil and gas. And they had a very vocal presence at the summit in Egypt. In particular, their chair, who is a gentleman called, he, on, on social media, he calls himself NJ Ayuk. His, his full name is Njok Ayuk Yong. And there was uh, reporting done during the summit that outed the fact he had been convicted for fraud in the US for impersonating a political official. And that also he was investigated for money laundering, money laundering uh, by Ghana's central bank. Now, despite that fact, he was given a badge to attend the COP27 summit and was a very prominent spokesperson platformed by a number of media outlets as a so-called voice of the region. And they are, you know, some of the posts up here are the kinds of arguments that they were making around the summit. So, you know, it's essential for, for Africa's energy to, to remain reliant on, on oil and gas, spreading um, continuing to spread misinformation about around renewables being unreliable, which have been repeatedly debunked and fact checked. Uh, using the, the catchphrase drill baby drill, which is extremely popular in other contexts, including the US. Um, and then this is getting picked up by, for example, Sputnik, which is again a Russian affiliated state outlet. Um, talking about how Russia is going to cooperate with, Af with Africa in increasing oil and gas infrastructure. And this article included an interview with NJ Ayuk. And then also this Gabinete de Comunicación at the top um, is from Equatorial Guinea and is spreading the claim that natural gas is a clean energy, which has been comprehensively debunked by climate science. And in fact, we refer to natural gas as fossil gas because the mere term natural gas creates confusion around the idea that it is clean and sustainable when actually that isn't the case. So again, this is much more of your kind of traditional industry sponsored or industry affiliated coordinated campaigning that is using platforms like COP as well as engagement with the media and extensive social media posting to try and influence public opinion and policy making within the region. The case, the third case study um, is around the escalation of rhetoric um, regarding climate activists. And this is true in Europe, it's true in South America, it's true in Africa, it's true in MENA, is that the way that people are talking about environmental movements and specific activists has become more and more violent in recent years. So rather than just saying these people are lunatics or, you know, they're part of the green, the green cult or, you know, we don't agree with their positions. Instead, you are seeing posts online that use sexually graphic language, that use death threats, that claim these these movements are responsible for, you know, economic um, distress, that, uh, that Greta Thunberg is the reason why people can't pay their energy bills, that youth movements advocating for climate change are the kind of death of society. And so there is the real direct attribution of blame that I think is a, is a very concerning trend, particularly in regions where you see an immediate translation to violence. So we are already witnessing more attacks against protesters, including in places like the UK. Uh, and I'm very concerned that that trend is going to continue in the months and the years to come as this conversation gets more and more heated and more and more grounded in abuse and harassment. And then the final uh, case study that I wanted to spotlight is around industry advertising, which we know is, uh, is prevalent not only in the global north, but also in the global south. The data that's on the screen here um, is the top 10 advertisers who we saw posting in this case on Facebook and Instagram around the COP27 summit. So we looked at around 850 entities that we knew were linked to industry and the top 
10 are on the screen here. Now, what's interesting about it is that it's not the, just the companies themselves who are advertising. So it's not just Petrobras or Shell or Exxon or Saudi Aramco, but instead it's these front and lobby groups who can be much harder to spot because often they have names that make them seem as if they are grassroots or citizen-led organizations. And this is a, a deliberate tactic on behalf of industry because you know, people have associations when they see company names. So by using these more neutral names like Energy for Progress or the Empowerment Alliance, they can spread advertising and try and launder their positions into the mainstream without having the associations of being connected to industry. But actually, if you dig into these groups, they are directly receiving funding, if not being led and developed by the PR and the front groups for the oil and gas industry. And what's also in interesting is how the vocabulary of greenwashing is evolving and changing. So most companies now want to be seen as climate champions, even though a tiny proportion of their investment portfolios are actually going into renewable energy infrastructure or you know, green initiatives. There was a report that came out uh, just last week, I think, that showed I think around 5% of most oil of most major uh, oil and gas companies um, investment is going into those initiatives versus the maintenance of the carbon economy and use of fossil fuels. Now that reality is not reflected in the advertising that they are spreading on social media. You know, you would think if only 5% of their uh, of their money is actually being spent on for example wind and solar how come the vast majority of adverts or campaigns that you will come across will be Shell talking about how it's the climate champion? And there is a very clear reason for that, which is that they are trying to improve their brand and their credibility amongst the general public. They are also weaponizing very emotive language in order to convince people that they are still that the fo that fossil fuels are still an important part of society and you know some of the some of this language on the side i think demonstrates that really cle clearly this was the most common terminology that we picked up in advertising so you see things here around energy independence and energy sovereignty the idea of referring to fossil gas as freedom gas the idea that fossil fuels are essential for human flourishing the idea of ethical oil Again, it goes back to the, that woke washing um, tactic that I talked about earlier, using progressive language, using positive language, using language that makes fossil fuels seem like a core part of people living their best lives and society achieving the best for its citizens. And then very quickly to finish off, um, I was asked to give you a little bit of horizon scanning on what we expect to see in the years ahead. I think the biggest one that I would encourage everybody on this call to, to dig into, there are a lot of explainers and, and fantastic um, sort of educational resources that are being, um, that are being published around so-called false solutions, which are being pushed by the fossil fuel industry and by a number of petrochemical states but are not going to solve the issue of climate change according to current scientific evidence. And good examples of that are hydrogen, fossil gas, and carbon capture and storage. All three of those technologies are being used as a way to weaken net zero targets. So instead of saying, you know, we need systemic change, we need to pivot our energy infrastructure, we need to change consumer behavior, et cetera, et cetera, industry or governments are arguing, no, 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 we're going to develop carbon capture and storage. It's going to suck all of the emissions out of the atmosphere and that will solve the problem. Even though all of the case studies or trials that have been done of those technologies have either failed or not delivered the results that were anticipated and they nowhere near exist at the scale needed to deal with the problem in the window of opportunity that currently exists.
And those kind of ideas will be pushed through paid advertising, and then they will be laundered through mainstream media outlets. So quite often, these ideas will actually be platformed by newspapers or TV programs or radio shows, um, because the fossil fuel industry is so successful in creating this messaging and convincing people that it's legitimate. The second is I would look out for, for state-sponsored influence operations, and in particular around COP28, which is happening in the United Arab Emirates in December, they are putting an enormous amount of effort into greenwashing their image. Uh, obviously, they are a huge oil producing company, but they would like to be seen as progressive on climate. And they have a local initiative called Mazdar, um, which they are promoting heavily in regions like sub-Saharan Africa to create the impression that they are good presidents for the COP summit, that they share the same values and priorities of other regions around the world. And again, you will also see foreign influence campaigns coming from Russia and coming from China and other countries who have clear trade and diplomatic goals in East Africa. Um, including around fossil fuel infrastructure or extraction or mining um, and want to influence public opinion of those through traditional social media through traditional and social media and then the last thing that i would watch out for are these arguments which can be very misleading around the reliability of renewable energies the idea that net zero is incompatible with improving you know deprivation or alleviating poverty the idea that you can't have a sustainable future and economic growth at the same time the idea that you need oil and gas for energy sovereignty you know i'm not saying that there is no credibility in those arguments but very often they are based on false evidence or cherry picked data that gives a very confusing impression for the reader, for the audience on what is actually happening. So you need to be extremely careful in presenting the nuance of these conversations and where there are efforts to deliberately mislead in order to maintain the carbon economy versus areas where there are legitimate questions around the pace and the scale of the net zero transition. And that is where I'm going to finish. Um, there are a couple of useful resources um, that I've highlighted in this PowerPoint, but maybe if I share it with um, with EJN, they can circulate it to everybody, and then I don't need to go through through them all because um, I know that we're running out of time. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Uh, that was, you know, uh, I mean, for the box, it, it was not provoking. Uh, it was, you know, very informative. Um, uh, and I'm sure our audience has, you know, really, you know, learned a lot. Uh, I, I have, and uh, it's actually a bit scares me of the work uh, that is there for us as members of the stage, how we are able to tell these stories. Um, you know, like my great concern is in your very first slides uh, when we were talking about how we can identify this information and the players of these uh, misinformation that people spread these. Uh, it's from oil and machines, but what scares me more is the organic uh, nature of these animal influencers and state media. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, how we can really identify these. Um, uh, and of course, uh, because we need to do a lot, uh, you know, to see uh, what um, all these organizations uh, that have all these kind of names, uh, how we able uh, to follow them and and, and also uh, call them out uh, as, as as you you know. And but other than that, I do you have a few minutes uh, for a few questions that I see here. Jenny, do you have a, a moment to ask a few questions? Yes, absolutely. I can stay for about another five minutes. I think there's already one question in the chat. Yes, there was a question uh, from uh, something that you actually started with when you were talking about uh, even for Africa, as much as Africa has all contributed a lot, I thought that we need to take you know, responsibility uh, to, have, to become a neutral. Uh, can you see uh, that question from Balunchama? Uh, 
uh, who is asking why Western countries use climate change uh, to be the development of African states. Uh, we have seen the EU start trying to start like a good oil pipeline. I think that pipeline, uh, uh, you know, uh, from the neighboring country uh, in Uganda, going for you know uh, about fifty million kilometers. I guess uh, I'm not seeing the fight to the two hundred million dollars project in you know, geoengineering. I don't know if we'll be able to talk on these. I'm not sure I, I, that I fully understood the question, but as yeah. I said, I think that there are very legitimate conversations around what the pace of change and the scale of change needs to be in sub-Saharan Africa. But but what I would say is, we've seen EU sabotage in East African coup pipeline, is that there, there is absolutely that there are legitimate hypocrisies or double standards to be pointed out and saying, talking about, for example, common but differentiated responsibility, which you may have come across in your reporting, uh, but is a, a, a long-standing point of negotiation within COP about historic polluters having more of a responsibility. Those are very legitimate discussions. And it, and it is perfectly reasonable for people to point out those hypocrisies without it being mis and disinformation. I am merely saying that there are also bad faith attacks um, that are claiming net zero as a whole or action on climate change is a form of neo-colonialism that I don't think is reflective of what scientists within the global south activists within the global south and policymakers within the global south are asking for in terms of future action there's another question as well here around um um would it constitute misinformation um to say that certain initiatives are not around ecological converse, conservation are coming, coming at the expense of people living within those communities. It really depends on the specific content. I would be very careful in jumping to the conclusion that things are mis or disinformation. Disinformation in particular has means that it has a deliberate intent to deceive the audience. So you, you need to hold yourself to quite a high standard if you're going to label something as disinformation. You have There has to be a reasonable assumption or, or proof that there is a clear effort to mislead the public in one direction or another through that information. However, I think that there are there can be really important influence operations that are trying to change public opinion, which might not fall neatly into those categories or under those terms. So with ecological conservation, of which I am very much not an expert, it feels like there are very much legitimate conversations to be had around how you do that while also balancing the human considerations of people living in those areas, the kind of cultural norms of those areas. Um, at the same time, there may well be actors who are trying to weaponize those arguments in order to prevent any climate action or in order to say that climate action as a whole is illegitimate. And that's where I think it verges into more dangerous territory or where it's clearly being used as a tactic rather than as a good faith conversation that should be happening between governments and citizens. I hope that makes sense. Uh, that makes sense. Uh... Uh, Jamie, uh, thank, thank you so much. much. Uh, you shared your resources. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation. Uh, as uh, one, one of our later uh, say, I think your presentation today gave, among others, a few ideas to look out for in the big energy commission lobby uh, for the upcoming COP28 in the UK in November. Uh, thank, thank you so much. much. That's all the time uh, we had. And I want to apologize uh, to our participants today. Uh, for the tech now challenge that we started, and and uh, for some issues that have come up when Jane just you know talked uh, about the presentation, uh, there was uh, a bad apple about ourselves who posted uh, you know uh, the same thing that we have seen in the past. So thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you so much for your presentation. 
we have Jury, uh, Jury uh, you know, Mood, uh, Dutch person. And, and this goes to the show, uh, the kind uh, of work that lies ahead of us. When we're talking about the first topic uh, of time management, misinformation, and disinformation, uh, amongst ourselves, we can see the elements of people who are not talking about. Uh, so okay, and I guess that's why, and I think that's why uh, they were trying to share you know, that uh, very you know, disturbing uh, content. Now, now I will invite uh, my colleague, Isabel, uh, to give us uh, the final words and tell us uh, about how to do our feeling as a survey of who to share the link. Isabel? Yes, thank you. And thank you so much, Jenny, for this very interesting and insightful uh, presentation. I think uh, we all uh, really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed that. Um, I just want to say two last things. Um, you might have seen that um, there was a link um, and it has been just re, um, re shared again in the chat. Um, in addition to this focus group discussions, we also um, have an online survey where we ask you a few questions um, about your experience with mis and disinformation. Um, please, uh, if you find the time, um, please um, complete this survey. It will be uh, very valuable to us um, to hear in a bit more detail your experience, how you work um, in despair of climate, uh, climate change, um, mis and disinformation. Um, and there is also another survey which is um, about this webinar where you can give some feedback of how your experience was in participating with us today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you, Jenny, uh, for joining us. And thank you, Isabel. Uh, we will stop there. Uh, kindly, uh, if you could share your feedback uh, with us, you see that on the chat. And we are looking forward to also for you uh, to take part uh, in this survey. Uh, of the link that uh, is actually you find it in your chat uh, as well. Uh, so we'll be sending you resources from this webinar, and then you can find this uh, recording on our journalism uh, at the website. Thank you so much.